Well, maybe not exactly the most revolutionary feature in 18.5, but one of those bread and butter tools that you and I are going to be using quite frequently in our setups might be the new pieces workflow. That is the attribute from pieces workflow in conjunction with the scatter align and the copy to points. Let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. Just going to drop down a grid, dab in there, use the scatter align tool to create a few points on there. Set this to point count method by number of points. So we're generating, let's say, 200 points here. And let's say we want to copy geometry on this. In our case, different pieces of geometry. So let's create maybe a box and a sphere. Set that to be polygonal, maybe like this. Let's add a torus. And finally, maybe a tube, which I'll set to be a polygon as well. And I'll check end caps and increase the number of columns a bit while decreasing the radius scale, maybe like that. Next, I'll merge all of these geometries together using a merge node, wiring in all the geometries in here. So they intersect and are now centered at 0, 0, 0 here. And in order for Houdini to be able to keep those individual pieces apart here, being merged into one geometry stream, I'll just plainly use the connectivity SOP, wire that in after the merge, and this will generate an integer attribute on each piece of connected geometry. So the box will have a different class attribute, different class integer number in the sphere of the torus of the tube. Let's have a look at this in our geometry spreadsheet and we can see we've got different values for our class integer on our points that belong to the box, to the sphere, to the torus and the tube respectively, ranging from zero to three. Back in our scene, let's drop down an attribute from pieces which is a new node in Houdini 18.5 and takes in a scattered point cloud onto which we're gonna instance these pieces and the pieces themselves, the stream containing each of those individual pieces, with an attribute on the geo stream that I'll use in a second to tell Houdini which parts of this geo stream belong to which of those meshes. So on the attribute from pieces, I'll set the piece attribute to class, because that's what I call this attribute in here in the connectivity SOP, and that should be it for the setup. So next I'll drop down a copy to points, and in here, this stream contains my target points, so I'll wire that into the second slot of the copy two points. And this stream here, after connectivity node, contains my geometry library, which I want to copy onto those individual points. And now let's highlight this. And you can see that it clearly did not work because what we didn't set up in the copy two points is the piece attribute name. So let's check that here and call this one class as well. And now you can see each of those individual pieces gets copied to one of those points that we set up in here in the attribute from pieces. And of course I can check shuffle pieces and dial in the seed if I don't like the distribution or can play a bit with the offset, change that distribution as well. Now let's use this example, this very basic example and build something slightly more complex. So instead of using this geometry here, let's load in a file and point this to an FBX, which I downloaded from exterior.com. And it's this one here. And this is a low poly version of a bunch of leaves. Don't worry, the texture with an alpha mask is provided as well as normals and an albedo. So we'll shade and render those in a second and they will look decent. However, what I wanna do now first is take each of those individual leaves and move it to the center. And to do this, I'm gonna use a for each connected piece loop, which are these three nodes. So my connectivity again, creating a class, this time on a primitive level, not on the points, and then a for each node. So this one now goes through each individual connected piece, in our case, each individual leaf. And in here, what I wanna do is create a bound node, which I'll set to generate a transform attribute, which stores the offset and the scale of this bounding box here. And I'll be using this in a point wrangle to transform my individual geometries to be at the center. To do that, first thing I wanna do is wire up this bound here in the second slot and look up the X form, the detail attribute we just wrote out. This is this four by four matrix here. So let's do that. Let's create a matrix, call it X form, and it should be equal to the detail attribute coming in through a second input slot with the ID one called X form, semicolon, that should be it. And to transfer my individual points on this geometry using this matrix here, all I have to do is multiply my point position by this matrix here. However, I want to invert this matrix as I want to negate the transform of my bounding box. So if my bounding box is offset to the side here, I want to negate that and move this bounding box back here to the center. So let's do that by taking our points position and multiplying it with the inverse, using the invert command of our transform matrix like this. So now you can see all of my leaves sit at the center. And if we go through them pass by pass, you can see here they sit. Okay, they're a bit big. So let's attach a transform node again and scale them down to a hundredth of their original size. Now that makes more sense. 
If we middle mouse on this now, we can see that this class attribute is not on the points. So we could either use an attribute promote or another connectivity node here. I'm just going to pipe it in this one here. It will write the class attribute onto our points as well. So now if I drag all of this down and maybe scale back this grid to be of a size of one by one, and then highlight my copy to points, nothing is happening. Although I can see a bunch of points here. And that is due to the fact that scatter align creates a p scale attribute, which is set to, I think, zero by default. Let's check. So, yeah, really tiny scale here on the p scale value. So, what I want to do is use an attribute randomize after the scatter align and set the p scale attribute, which is a float, so it has only one dimension, to range between a value of 0.2 and maybe 0.8, like so, resulting in these leaves being scattered here. On the scatter align, let's increase the number of points to maybe 2000, so it gets a bit more dense. And under the orientation, let's dial in rotation around the normal, between 0 and 360 degrees, and maybe a bit of randomness in a cone around the normal, say, around 30 degrees. So now we scatter those individual leaves onto this plane here. Now you can see with this for each loop here. I made it rather straightforward to pick apart these 77 individual leaves without having to go through them individually. All right, let's clean this up a bit and load in a few pieces of geometry to scatter those leaves onto. Using a file node, I'm going to load in two pieces that I created earlier, one using the vellum cloth brush, this one here called pillow tubes, which looks like this. And let's drop down another file node and load in the base here, which is just a slab. And if we merge those two, we have this geometry sitting on its base here. Now I could just use the scatter align to create points on that geometry and scatter leaves onto this. Let's ghost the underlying geometry. And you could see that would smack leaves onto every single face, even especially if we increase the total number of leaves on here, like so. Now, if I want to easily control where those leaves go, that means how dense my scattering is in which areas of this geometry, I could either paint in an attribute or write a bit of vex, or I could use the newly created mask by feature node in Houdini 18. So I will wire this in after I merge my two geometries and highlight it directly and then select its tool handle. And you can see this red area is where my mask value, which I'll later use as a density map for my scattering to drive where many points will be, is high. And also down here in the mask by feature, you have lots of controls and lots of options how to dial in this mask. So on the one hand, you have this vector. So we can calculate this mask depending on the direction. So maybe something like this. And what you will see is this direction automatically casts shadows here. So these areas will be left blank. If we uncheck this, we can see now we are only selecting all parts which point in the direction of this vector. And if we check cast shadow, we are now omitting these areas where we have shadow from an imaginary light, which would be in the direction of this vector. Let's just pipe this into our scatter line here. And on the scatter line itself, let's check a density attribute which by default is called mask here. So let's call this density attribute mask and highlight our copy to points. Now we can see A, the leaves are only scattered in the direction of this vector and also the areas where there's shadow are omitted in the scattering. Also in the mask by feature here, if we don't want any shadows or a directional mask here, we can also use an ambient occlusion pass to calculate which areas are exposed and which areas aren't. So in this case, areas which are occluded here in the middle of the geometry receive a smaller mask and thus density value than areas which are more exposed, resulting in a leaf distribution that will look something like this. Clearly not what I want in this case, however, it's I think useful for scattering dirt or dust particles. In my case, I just wanna stick with the directional map and the cast shadow here. Let's just highlight that mask by feature node again and pay attention to maybe those areas on the sides here where we stick in leaves on the sides of this base plate here. So the way we can dial this in is by going down here and remapping our directional mask. So currently this is just a linear ramp. And if I want to get rid of those values here, let's take this lower value slider and drag it over to be somewhere in the middle like this and maybe drag the full value slider to the middle as well a bit. So we're increasing the contrast here. And by this, if we highlight the copy to points node again, we can see we omitted some of these leaves here now. So let's drag this in a bit further. And now we can see, drag this over, almost have no leaves on this side here. Okay, again, let's clean this up a bit and attach a few nulls here. Call one out underscore leaves and call the other one out underscore pillows and the final one out underscore base. Maybe something like this. One final thing before I'm going into rendering my pillows here, if I attach a UV quick shade, they do have UVs on them, I provide them. And my leaves over here, they don't. Even though when I import them, 
they do have UVs on them. So what's going wrong here? Well, let's copy this over. In my copy to points here, I'm copying over all attributes except those listed here with this hat symbol in front of them. And it turns out I'm also copying the UVs from this stream here with the pillows over to my leaves, which I don't want. So the solution for this is in the copy to points. Under the attributes I want to exclude, let's to them attach another hat call this one UV. So we're not copying over the UVs and not overriding them. So now I'm passing through my UVs, which have been on the leaves themselves, like so. I think now we can move over to Solaris and set this up for preview rendering in COM. So to do that, I'll go over to my Solaris desktop and in here, drop a SOP import first, point this one to my out base, copy this, paste this, point this one to my out pillows, copy this and paste this one more time, and this will point to my out underscore leaf, bringing in all those three pieces individually. Next, I'll attach a material library to each of those, one, two, and three. And in here, I'm gonna set up the materials. Let's start with the leaves first, as this is the most interesting material in my opinion. I'm gonna zoom in on this a tiny bit here, and before I go into the material library, let's check the sign geometry and select all geometry primitives here. Now let's dive in here and drop down a principal shader, go up one level and just in the material vault tab of the material library, select that principal shader we just created. So that's this one here. Okay, now we're set to go. And in this shader here, let's set the base color to be all white. And under the textures tab, let's check base color. And I'm gonna point that to a file that came in the download here, which is this, the albedo, that's the diffuse color. Yet, however, we're seeing nothing in the viewport. So to fix that, let's go up again to the stage context here. And after this material library, let's create an environment light and a camera by control clicking onto those nodes and just added them in the wrong order. So let's drag those down here, connect the sub import straight up to the material library and then the material library into the dome light and camera. And now that we have a light and the camera on here, you can see we're seeing a texture on those individual polygons. However, we have not yet given our material an opacity or alpha mask. So let's do that now, dive in the material library again and under the textures tab, Let's drag this down and check use texture for opacity. I'm gonna point this to my alpha here that came with a download. And now you can see a few shading errors, but overall this accepts my alpha mask here. I think one final tweak I wanna do is on the surface tab here. Let's just dial back reflectivity to say 0.2 and increase the roughness to 0.5 maybe. All right, back up again and let's create a material for our pillows here. As these materials to render properly in the viewport also need a dome light and a camera, before we start tweaking this material, let's just set up a merge node and merge all these three SOP imports with their material libraries into one geo stream so we can see them all together in the viewport and then wire this into our dome light and camera respectively. All right, material library two is where I'm gonna set up the pillow material. So let's dive in there. Let's create a principal shader, maybe call this one pillows. And let's just quickly assign this. So point the material bob to the material we just created and also check assign to geometry and select all geometry primitives. And this is our material coming through. Again, let's dive into the material library and in the pillows themselves, I wanna use a normal map of a piece of cloth I downloaded. So I'm gonna point it to that file. Keep in mind that it's important for all files to show properly to check off show sequences as one entry. And also let's right click in here and uncheck show images and go to the right folder, which is this one and my fabric pattern normal is here. So that's a normal map. Just gonna leave it set its default settings. And on the surface itself, I wanna increase the metallic to one. Also, let's set the base color to something brighter, maybe 0.5, something like that. And let's dial back the roughness a tiny bit. And you can see here that normal coming through nicely, showing that fabric texture. Finally, let's build a quick material for the base here. Again, checking assigned to geometry and selecting all geometry primitives and then diving in here dropping down a principal shader, calling this base. And let's just give it a darkish gray color, dial back its reflectivity a bit and increase its roughness a tiny bit. Just a really coarse material. Finally, I'll just wanna slam down a ground plane using a grid. And for this, I'll just copy over this material library node of our base here, wire this in, and also merge this with our other geometry. And I think this needs to be translated down a bit. So I'm just gonna use these handles here and I'll just move that down so it doesn't intersect with our geometry like so. Okay, let's look through our camera again by highlighting this camera here and then selecting it and locking it to the viewport so we can position it. Wanna give this a bit of a longer focal length, let's say 85 millimeters, classical portrait, something like this maybe. And I see I need a bigger ground plane. So let's scale this grid up by a factor of let's say four in our case. For the dome light, I'm gonna select an HDR, which I downloaded, which is this. And finally, I wanna attach comma render properties to this 
in here just on the limits let's increase the diffuse limit to maybe four and the reflection limit to say eight as there's quite a bit of interreflection in here and now let's just finally save this and switch our viewport over to karma and this looks a bit dark so let's tweak the settings here in the dome light under the base properties let's increase the light intensity to maybe 10 maybe even 15 or possibly 20. I think my leaves are a bit small so let's go back to our obj context in here under the attribute randomize let's just tweak those values to range between 0.6 maybe and 1.4 let's go back to our stage slash solaris context already looking a bit better maybe let's add a few more leaves so in my obj context in the scatter align let's increase the total number to 12,000 maybe again back to our staging context and I mean, this is a nice starting point, which I'll continue to tweak. Maybe add a bit of geometry, maybe add a bit of shaders, maybe a gobo to give this kind of the impression of some shadow from a nearby plant falling on this whole thing here. But overall, that's how you'd be working with, let's go to the OBJ, the attribute from pieces node to pick apart a given piece of geometry and then copy it to individual points using a simple single copy to points node in conjunction with the scatter align node that's new to Houdini in 18.5 and the really powerful mask by features node, which allows you to easily create those masks using a directional vector, which also casts shadows or an ambient occlusion without having to write a single line of vex or even using bobs. So I'm gonna continue working on this here. And if you guys wanna support us or wanna learn more about Houdini, gain access to exclusive content, in-depth courses, head over to Patreon and consider supporting us. And to everyone supporting us already, Thanks so much, guys. It is your support that makes Syntagma possible. With a very special thank you going out to important-looking pirates, Patrick Fillion, Chris Hebert, and Rafik Anadol. Thanks so much, guys.